was a whole frame up, you see. And I got up and I said, well, they should be named my instruments because after all, yours were impossible to use. <laughs> and I had friends coming up. I said, oh, Howard, we got to get you and Ned together. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember that. Uh, oh, I remember uh, that. Yeah. A lot of byplay on that. Well, you know, as we look at those pictures taken 20 years ago, back in New York, yeah. at Columbia, with yeah. Ned Fowler and Milo Bassett, it's amazing. Here it is 20 years later. I must confess that uh, none of us look quite the same as we did then. No, we don't. Not quite well, general. you know, we're here to discuss the Stapes era. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate, John, you coming out to Los Angeles and you, Sam, to be here for this occasion and take your busy schedules to, to join us. We really far, rather felt that this was a very important classic and we'll go down to history, in history, as a most uh, valuable uh, audiovisual history of the development of Stapes surgery in this country that revolutionized the treatment of otosclerosis in the world. Sam, would you like to tell us a little bit about how this all started. You were the father of it, and let's hear your story. I'm beginning to feel like a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was in 1952 that I decided that I would like to lift up the eardrum and test for mobility of the stapes, since I had a short time before operated on a woman, ostensibly, who had otosclerosis, but in fact, at the operation, I found that the sapies was mobile, and therefore, she could not get a good result that day, and Franz Altman was in the operating room with me, and I turned to him, and I said, have a look in here, and he saw that the stapes was mobile. And I, I said, uh, Franz, have you ever had this experience? And he said, yes, once. And I thought to myself, well, if he had one and I had one, then there are probably many more around the world that are having the same experience. And in order to be absolutely certain that the stapes was rigid and therefore suitable for surgery. I used Lempert's method when he did tympanosympathectomy by lifting up the skin of the canal and drum and actually tested the stapes for fixation or mobility. And uh, I did that to five consecutive patients that uh, I would ordinarily do a, lab, a uh, Lempert operation on. And the first five patients had very rigid stapes. And a few weeks later, I would do the fenestration. But then I was certain And uh, the sixth one was a man about 45 or 6 with the typical findings of otosclerosis. A very intelligent man, an engineer. And I told him the story of this woman who couldn't possibly benefit by the operation that I did because her stapes was mobile. And I said, it's up to you. I can either take you to the hospital and do the fenestration operation at once, or I could, in a 15 or 20 minute time, I could lift up the eardrum and actually be sure, one way or the other, whether you have a rigid stapes that should be dealt with. And he said, uh, he immediately caught on, very bright man. <laughs> and uh, 
And uh, he said, uh, well, let's go to the hospital and do the preliminary. And it was at that time, uh, after I lifted up the eardrum and exposed the incus and stapes, and I was testing to see if that stapes was mobile. It wasn't mobile, but I wasn't sure how immobile it was. So I just kept on doing it two or three times, and suddenly he said, Doctor, I can hear everything. And he said, I just heard a long instrument, I think, hit a solid enamel pail. That was four or five operating rooms away. And of course, I heard it after he called my attention to it. I remembered hearing it myself. So I was pretty certain then that he was really hearing. I was so excited at that moment that I hardly could believe it. But I whispered to him, can you hear me? Very soft whisper. And he said, uh, are you yelling? Well, Sam, uh, I believe you told me something about an egg came into the picture about this time. Wasn't there a comment about uh, eggs? That was really a, a, an interesting situation. I had been doing stapes for quite a while, and Ned Fowler said to me one day, if you ask the patient in a whisper, can you hear me? He is apt to anticipate what you are saying. So I said, well, I'll change it. And on this man, I said in a very soft whisper, do you like scrambled eggs? And he said, yes, with bacon. <laughs> now, about what time was it then that uh, uh, you uh, began to uh, visit with Dr. Lempert and uh, develop your techniques in fenestration prior to uh, your discovery of the uh, stapes mobilization uh, procedure? Well, there were some people who felt that they shouldn't get near Lempert at all. And I was uh, one of those victims for a while until I couldn't stand it any longer. And I said to myself, I don't care who it would be that would in any way obstruct my learning from Lempert. I'm going. And and what year would that have been, Sam, about? Well, that would have been in 19... 48, 49. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so Lempert had been doing his work there for quite some time oh prior yeah, to that. yes. And I suppose you were beginning to see patients uh, who had been previous patients of Dr. Friesner's coming back uh, uh, hearing after Lempert had operated on them, and this must have sparked a tremendous interest in your, your feeling that you should learn uh, this fenestration operation. Yes. Is that, is that right? Yes. The spark was very strong when it hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so then having uh, developed your techniques in fenestration, you began doing fenestration. And oh, yes. And this led to the ultimate story yes. you told, him, told uh, about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, I felt that I had to prove beyond any doubt that a patient on the operating table did, in, ha in fact, have a rigid state piece, otherwise there'd be no point in doing the surgery. Mm -hmm. And when this man could hear so acutely on the operating table, I got very, I don't know whether it was tense or anxiety or fear or making a touchdown, mm -hmm. but I favored the touchdown. <laughs> Well, I know in 19, and it took you only from 1952, um, you did a tremendous amount of cadaver work developing your techniques and your touch and your instruments and your feel. Uh, and then gradually 
began more and more uh, doing these uh, stapes mobilizations so that I recall, I think it was about 1955, uh, Joe Goldman called me, and I believe it was before you'd published anything on it. When was your first publication? I think it was in, uh, in 52. 52. In the New York State. Uh -huh. In the New York State Journal. Journal, yes. Well, I know I was quite unaware of it, and uh, Dr. Goldman called me, and uh, Joe Goldman, and said, you know, I think you ought to come back to New York and see what Dr. Rosen is doing. And uh, I got on a plane and went back, and I remember how impressed I was to uh, see you working. Uh, you were using at the time a headlight and loop as before we had the microscope situation. Yes. And I was trying to crowd in and take a, a look over your shoulder. It was rather difficult, you know, no observing tubes uh, to teach this work. Uh, very difficult. And I remember how impressed I was the uh, minute uh, something happened and these patients would say, uh, oh, doctor, uh, things yeah. sound so loud. Well, you know, uh, Sam, as we get into this mobilization situation, uh, you may remember that uh, Ben Tanton, who was a very fine otologist from Vancouver, and also an equally talented uh, cartoonist, and uh, he sent down some slides for me, and I have used them all over the country whenever I talked about Stapes mobilization and Sam Rosen. And so, uh, here it is. Swing and sway. <laughs> and there you are, swinging and swinging this, uh, uh, this nice. Stapes foot plate. Yeah. And I remember so much, the first time your wife, Helen, saw this, she came after, uh, up to me uh, afterward and uh, said, you know, I do wish you'd put some pants uh, or some shorts around Sam. Uh, I think that's a little uh, undignified. But nevertheless, it's always gotten a great laugh, and there you are, our great Sam Rosen. Very funny. Now, John, uh, as we get into stapedectomy and taking out the foot plate, uh, Ben also had one to cover that, you know? And so he sent this one down. And you can see yourself there scratching your head, do you see? And you've also got kind of a, oh, you probably goodness. should add a little pair of shorts on. Oh, yeah. But nevertheless, there you are looking down into this cavity with that paralymph there like a swimming pool. And I can see you just wondering, well, what do we do now? Yeah. Do we put some covering over to some kind of so what? Yeah. How are we going to get this thing connected up between that paralymph and that incus that Sam was referring to, yeah. uh, to mobilize that paralymph? So there you are, John. Uh, and there again, that picture has been shown all over the world and every place it's shown, needless to say, it's gotten a big, uh, big kick out of it. But uh, Sam, getting back to mobilization for a little while, uh, we all began to realize that uh, these were closing up and maybe there'd be some other approach uh, to this. Uh, you were pretty closely associated, of course, with Ned Fowler there in New York. You knew him well and yes. the work he was doing. And I think he came out about that time uh, or shortly thereafter with the concept of, of the um, anterior crotomy procedure. Yes. Remember that? Yes, I do. And uh, did you ever... Uh, attempt to do that type of procedure? Uh. Well, I didn't attempt that until some time later. Mm -hmm. I was still concentrating on what can be done to the foot plate that will mobilize the paralymph because the bottom line in stapes surgery is to mobilize the parent. If you don't mobilize the parent, no matter what else you may do, mm -hmm. you're not going to get better hearing. And so I decided to perforate the foot plate. Yes, I remember that. And that created a lot of, of interest and controversy around the country also. Yeah, and it certainly created a lot of converse of that in, in, in me. Yeah. And you I... Know, Sam, not that you didn't have enough trouble, but when you went and started talking about making holes, then every one of the old-fashioned sort of don't do anything, let it, you know, be as it is, people were really on your neck. We, Howard and I both remember that second big step. Yeah. They were not only on my neck, but they've been on other parts of my anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that all of these things that I tried, perforating the footplate, 
And in that procedure, Taking you didn't apart. disturb the, the arch at all, or No, no, I left. You just went straight to the yeah. footplate, made a little yeah. hole in it. Yes. And some of those people seem to hear better by the phase differential, I assume, between they did. The, exactly. the oval by window the phase and the round window. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but when I put the drum and skin back in place, the improvement that they had with that little hole in the footplate mm -hmm. uh, didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was less. Yes, it was less than it was. You'd hear better with the drum up, but yes. you put it back. Yeah, back and down. I felt, I felt in in due deference to the patient mm -hmm. that I should put the drum back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. Uh, I want to say one or two things, if I may, about what happened to me at the moment that first inadvertent mobilization occurred. I came home and talked to Helen and the children about this thing. They were pretty hip about what was going on. I didn't dare talk to anyone else about it. And uh, I tried to reconstruct what I had done just the instant before this man said, I can hear everything. And uh, I found that that was impossible. I didn't know what I was doing at a given instrument, at a given instant that I could recall. And I said, now I did this, or now I did that. But it was a smooth kind of thing. Uh, you were writing a whole chapter and not a, not a sentence. And I just couldn't dope it out. So I started to do some cadavers. And I think I probably, before I operated on this man, I think I may have done six or 700 operations on the cadaver so that I could really feel that I wasn't doing, couldn't do anything that was going to hurt the patient. Well, I uh, would like to correct a mistake I did all this cadaver work after I operated on this patient mm -hmm. the first time, and his hearing was restored, not before. Well, in New York, you know, uh, Lempert, anyone who is a pioneer and who develops something new, I think invariably faces a tremendous, tremendous number of obstacles uh, by their own colleagues, uh, placed before them by their own colleagues, critics, and yet later on, so often as history repeats itself, those most severe critics become your most ardent uh, disciples. I think this was true in Lempert's uh, era, and then in your era, of the beginning of the mobilization era, and certainly, John, in, in your era, uh, stapedectomy. And I think this is uh, the history of uh, yes. new efforts. <coughs> I think and Howard, it takes a great, me. great man, I think, to to face up to these obstacles and really uh, overcome them. And if his theories and principles are correct, he's going to win out in spite of all those obstacles yeah. that's put before him. Well, I remember this being about 1955 when I went back to New York, and I recall at the time uh, the tremendous interest that was developing in this uh, field of endeavor. We all had different types of methods of mobilizing. I remember, you perhaps do, and I'm sure John does, my father being a dentist. Uh, you know, they used to pound in these little amalgam fillings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got Dad to work with me on a little instrument <laughs> with a air I pump. Remember that, you remember that air pump? Yeah. Very well. And uh, <laughs> I, remember. I could adjust that so that you'd get one little poke, you know, or, and you can control not only one at a time, or you could increase it so it was very rapid. And I also remember so vividly, uh, you could in increase the intensity of it so that the blow would be very minimal, singular or multiple, uh, or very severe. Yeah. And I remember sending one of those machines <coughs> back to Mike Koss in Iowa City, uh, because it seemed pretty logical for a little while. And Mike had it adjusted wrong. And I remember he knocked one too hard, and you know where it went. <laughs> And the result was Mike accused me of sabotaging his efforts in, the, in Iowa.
But uh, it's just another example yeah. of the many different instruments and things yeah. we did to try to overcome the obstacles presented by that fixed stapes. Sam, uh, you also have emphasized over the years that stapes mobilization was a very delicate procedure, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, so at a meeting, uh, we were talking about mobilization, and uh, I remember our dear friend uh, Dean Lyerly yes. uh, presented me with a plaque uh, afterward, a, a picture, and he got a big kick out of it giving it to me after I had stressed your emphasis that it was a very delicate procedure. So he gave me this, uh, mobilizing the stages, <laughs> a very delicate procedure. Oh. And there I am, Sam, with my air hammer. Uh, pounding the stapes to try to get it loose. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't agree with that type of technique. Uh, well, I know one thing, that whatever instrument you had in your hand, it would always be done delicately. <laughs> I always try it anyway, yeah. sir. It was long then about that time, John, that I remember uh, we had a, a meeting at Montreal. Yes. I think it was 19... about 56. Six. And... Uh, John came up to me. We had a, a, a mobilization uh, panel. And uh, at that time, um, these were the, at every meeting, there were always mobilization papers all over the place. Everybody had a different little touch. And I recall <laughs> in Montreal, John, you coming up to me. I was moderating a panel. Sam, you were on that panel. Yes. I've forgotten who the others were, but whoever uh, they were. Fowler and... Ned Fowler, Jr. and... Uh, George Shambaugh. George Shambaugh, yeah. that's right. I've got a slide of the you? paper. I'll show it in a minute. Well, you know, it was kind of interesting because you came up to me and you said, uh, Howard, he said, uh, you know, and you showed me a little artificial uh, stapes yes. you made. Yes. And you said that you had gone back to Memphis and you had indeed uh, taken out a stapes and put in this artificial stapes and the patient was hearing. Yes. Well, you know, knowing what Lempert had been through and knowing what Sam had been, it was into, you know. Was going through. <laughs> was going through <laughs> with all of these uh, obstacles and critics and so on. Uh, I recall so vividly saying, uh, well, you know, uh, let's get this in the literature, John, uh, because it is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Good, mm -hmm. bad, or indifferent, we mm -hmm. should have it. And mm -hmm. if you sent that in for publication in those days, you wouldn't have a prayer no, having it published. No. And so I remember after this, about an hour, an hour and a half of mobilization, uh, discussions and presentations by the panel. We had about a half hour left for questions from the audience. It was a large audience at this meeting and uh, due to stop at 12 o'clock. And I said, now, John, I'm going to ask for questions from the audience and uh, uh, they can come up and discuss over the microphone so everyone can hear them if they like. But in your case, I'm going to about three minutes before 12. I said, now, it's time for one more discussion. Remember that? I do. And, uh, I uh, looked over, you raised your hand, and I said, Dr. Shea. And uh, here this young fellow comes up there at the podium, you know, and presents his, his case, showed the stapes, and showed the audiogram. And I'm sure there must have been 20 little slips of paper running up to me from the front row and the second row. You know, I must discuss this paper. <laughs> I, I can't let this be said without saying something about this, you know. This is terrible, in essence, you know. And I looked at my watch, I remember, very very serenely, and I pounded the camel and I said, gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry. There's many more questions, many more would like to ask questions about this presentation this morning, but the time is up. It's exactly 12 o'clock, and I pounded the gavel. But, John, we got that in the transactions That's and right. the discussions. Yeah. That's remember? Right. I do, do, Howard, and I appreciate that, it. That was a, uh, an interesting uh, time. And from it's then on, of course, it's... Quite, uh, quite history. Well, John, I, I think really that it'd be nice to hear your story now. Uh, from the time that uh, we began to take off uh, and look at, uh, at stapedectomy as a procedure to uh, overcome the problems that Sam was having and Ned Fowler Jr. was having with his anterior carotomy uh, by approaching it by, in any fashion by leaving it in. Uh, so where do we go from there, John? You, you presented well, that at Montreal, and you shook the whole country by it, and you've shaken the whole country <laughs> since then. <laughs> well, so uh, why don't we start with a little okay. bit of your story? Let me, let me start back with... Uh, I was in my residency at the Mass Ironier Infirmary in 1950. The Korean War started. 
and I was in the active naval reserve. I got called up, had to leave my residency, went off in the service. And uh, I'd had eight months of residency, went off and spent two years in the service, and had the opportunity to do a lot of ear surgery, uh, in fact, a lot of surgery of all types because of the lack of doctors in the military during the Korean War. Came back to Boston in October of 1952, having finished two years of military service. My father was still alive, and uh, I hoped to complete my residency. Unfortunately, he died the next month, and uh, I had already finished and taken my boards. I was taking my residency after having completed the boards, but I had not had my residency, so I was going to go take that. And when he died and had lots of other problems, I just decided to go home and start practicing. I, I, I said, well, I'm interested in otology, and I'll, I'll train myself as I can. I arranged to come out and take your course in January of 1953, and uh, came out. If you recall, we had uh, operate with you in the morning. Mike Flynn, uh, who was living here in the Los Angeles area then, I think mm -hmm. he since yeah. moved back east, was, yeah, he and I took right. the course together. You teach us uh, mostly fenestration surgeries in the morning, occasionally doing some other things. Uh, and uh, in the afternoon, we'd be with you in your office. And uh, in the evening, you'd come over to the county hospital. We'd go in the morgue and dissect the cadavers. And this was six days a week, and the weekends we'd study. And uh, about that time, an associate you had, uh, I guess, went and practiced on his own, and I completed the course. And You talked to me about joining he you here and remaining in Los Angeles, and so I did. My wife and children remained in Memphis, and I stayed on about uh, four months, on up into the, I think, April or uh, May or June. And my daughter got pneumonia, and I had to fly home one day suddenly, and she was in the hospital. And as things turned out, I, I never got back. Uh, it was just not possible for me to remain. That was June 6, 53. But I w we'd been talking about mobilization. It was, it was the thing. And Rosen was carrying the ball, and everybody was banging on him in every direction. But it was obviously what had to be done. And we were... Howard and I talking about, well, take the stapes out and replace it with something else. And in the fall of 53, Sam, I came to Mount Sinai and visited with you. I'll never forget that first morning. I went in and saw you operate. And uh, here it is 24 years later. You haven't lost any of the skill and agility uh, you had then. I see you snap your fingers with the same manual dexterity you had then. I wondered and marveled at your ability. and I think you noticed I was very interested. And you said, here's a man who can take the ball and go and help defend this procedure. And with your generous in, uh, support, you recommended I go to Vienna and, and do intensive cadaver work over there through your friendship with Franz Altman, who was from Vienna originally. He wrote to Novotny, who was chief of the first ear clinic in the uh, university there. You arranged for me to go. And, uh, and in January of 1954, I went to Vienna with your arrangements. And uh, if I can, I'd like to show uh, some slides from that period. Uh, uh, they were hard years for me, and uh, I think these slides would show it. Let me say this first. Let me go back a minute. Uh, in the period where I was working with, with uh, Howard uh, and dissecting at the county hospital, uh, in the evening when we'd be dissecting, uh, one of us would dissect and the other would read uh, important papers in the literature. And, that paper by Sam Rosen, uh, Palpation of Stapes for Fixation, which appeared in the December 1952 archives, was a paper of such tremendous importance. I read that over and over again. That's the first, that's the paper in which Sam reports this extraordinary case. 
Here is the actual case report, Sam. I'm going to, like they do on This Is Your Life, This Is Your Life, Sam. <laughs> That's right. This is that case that, that this is the case heard around the world, and, and this is real discovery. You, you, you were thinking, studying, you wanted to know why, you made an observation, and you reported it. This is the perfect scientist. And this paper was in my mind. This had my imagination. From then on, I was, it was like dope. I had to have more. And through your kindness, you arranged for me to go to Vienna. I worked in the Hals, Nasen, or in Krankenheiten, the University of Vienna. And here you see my instructor, uh, Kurt Burian. Dr. Novotny put me under the care of Kurt Burian. He's still in Vienna, a great friend of mine still. And he was my friend and instructor, taught me a little German. And I remained there um, and in Europe about four months. Here's a picture of the uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral in the Stephensplatz, the place near which I lived. Here's a picture showing the street on which I lived and up on the left, the Graben Hotel. That hotel room cost me a dollar and a quarter a day. <laughs> and uh, I found out later it was the headquarters of the Russian spy network in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> Here are one or two more pictures. Here's where I used to get the bus in the morning to go to work, and, and I'm telling you, those were cold, difficult days. On the way back, again at your invitation, I went by the uh, Canton Spital in Zurich, and there I met Professor Rudy and saw him doing his beautiful work in fenestration, and he had me demonstrate stapedectomy there for the first time. It was over there in Vienna that I read the literature the world literature. Now, John, what, what year was this again? This uh, was April 1954. I see. I was coming back from four months in Vienna, oh. and Ham arranged for me to go to Zurich. And you demonstrated the stapedectomy uh, to, to on a Rudy. cadaver at that point. That's right. To you Rudy. hadn't yet done it on a living no, person. No, no. Yeah. But the, 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 the idea was already in my mind. Having read the literature and realized that it had been done, the person's work that caught my imagination was Frederick L. Jack of Boston, who... About the turn of the century. And in 1880, 1892, mm -hmm. reported to the American Otological Society 70 stapedectomies. Uh, and he was literally hounded out of that American Otological Society right. for, for doing that. It's but a very interesting story. But yourself. he had the he had studied just as I had in Vienna. He was uh, he had gone to the Harvard Medical School and he had trained at the Mass Iron Ear Infirmary. And the most curious thing that in 1948, when I was a resident at the Mass Iron Ear Infirmary, this man came to one of the Wednesday meetings being conducted by Dr. Shaw, and he was introduced, and I met him. And I, I saw what he was then 92 years old, but very, very handsome man, still very clever. When I f read his work, I could recall having met him, and it, had, it made me realize this man was clever at 92. Well, at, at 55 or 60, when he made these discoveries, uh, his work was very important. It was this paper that really made me realize it could be done. The supplemental report of a double stapedectomy operated on 10 years before. This was a 10-year follow-up to the meeting in 1902, the American Otological Society. But in this one case, where he took the stapes out of a young girl, he took it out of one ear and, and three weeks later took it out of the other, and she heard well 10 years later. Nice. But he didn't replace it with anything at that point. But her drum became adherent to the margins of her oval window. And this made me realize what the problem was. In the previous era, they took the stapes out, but they never bothered to reconstruct the sound conducting mechanism. In this one patient, her drum became adherent to the margins of her oval window, and she got a hearing gain. This was the clue. What we had to do was reconstruct the sound conducting mechanism. And throughout 1954, the rest of 54, and 55, I, I searched for a way to do this. And in August of 1955, I did the first stapedectomy in which I took out the stapes. I covered the oval window with loose connective tissue. Where did you get the 
connective tissue at the time, do you recall? It was subcutaneous tissue from the ear canal, just mm -hmm. from the incision site, a little bit, and I pressed it. And then I took a piece of cortical bone from a cortical bone bank at the Campbell Clinic there in Memphis, an orthopedic clinic. They had cortical bone stored in bottles, and I took a piece of this and made a stapes in this first patient. I used bone. But, and the patient heard well at first, but then the middle ear became a mass of adhesions and the hearing gain was lost. But the patient didn't lose her hearing completely. So this was a clue. We had to get a better material. And in this first stapedectomy that I reported in Montreal, uh, and these are, I, I actually made a remnant of the stapes out of Teflon and covered the oval window with a slice of subcutaneous tissue. Here you see the Teflon replica of the stapes, and here you see it in place attached to the incus. Uh, so, so distorted uh, or unclear were my thoughts at the time. I thought the stapes replica had to exactly resemble the stapes that we were uh, re removing, but of course we know now it, it didn't have to. But this was the first patient that was successfully operated. This girl uh, heard well, and uh, the last time I heard from her, she moved away from Memphis and I was lost to follow up many years ago. But when I, during uh, all the time that I was able to follow her, she did have a, a, he a permanent hearing gain. And this is the patient I reported to that. Mm -hmm. To that meeting. To that meeting, <laughs> and uh, as you say, you engineered it so that all of these people who wanted to howl at me uh, didn't have a chance. At least they delayed it a little. That's right. <laughs> I must say that when I finished this presentation, I thought uh, I thought uh, I'd, I'd get a certain amount of uh, acceptance and uh, people happy that this had been done. Instead, I had to have lunch by myself. Uh, uh, nobody would even sit and have lunch with me. It was, uh, people were trying to shun me, I think, for talking about such horrible things. But this was the first successful stapedectomy in May of 1956. But the first one, really, was in August of 55, and uh, it wasn't permanently successful. It, it was better, but we just needed the right material. Well, then after you developed this, uh, this approach to the situation, uh, then you got over to polyethylene and the Bain graft. Right. Uh, and I believe this was perhaps the, the next step, wasn't it, John? It was. And uh, in this period, in the summer of 1957, I went to Bordeaux. And I visited with Michel Portman, who was very instrumental and helpful in this early period. He was a, and still is, a great pioneer, as his father was and is. And he was thinking about things we could do. We were taking out the stapes, uh, foot plate, and leaving part of the crura there and, and, and interposing vein. I did a series like this of seven cases. And uh, we were using the posterior crust as the, to, to reconstruct the sound conducting mechanism, covering the oval window with vein. I went over and met with Michel and operated and demonstrated this operation in Bordeaux in the summer of 1957. And he became taken with the technique and adopted this and followed it with great interest and eventually for many years, as you know, remained with the concept of using the posterior crust over the vein graft. Uh, I found those seven cases that I did in that summer to have not be as permanent as I wanted, and finally I went on to, in the time of the second, second symposium on mobilization of the stapes, again with you as moderator. Uh, this was in San Francisco. I was able to report uh, on 88 patients in whom I'd operated, in which we took the foot plate out and uh, removed the arch of the stapes, covered the oval window with a vein graft, and then put in a polyethylene strut. I'm showing you the actual pictures from that article and presentation. I reported 88 and uh, reported a hearing gain in 
55% of those, closure of the air boom gap. That was spectacular. I recall that so vividly. And uh, I believe that was, that was really the, the end of the beginning. By this time, with 88 patients and up to three-month follow-up on the shortest and as much as two-year follow-up on some of them, uh, the, the, the idea was well started. And, uh, well, I remember you coming out to Los Angeles and demonstrating it uh, to us along about that time. With the well, it was, uh, it was the next week after that symposium yeah, I came, came down, down to Los Angeles right. from San Francisco. As we look back on this, the three of us, and we've been talking about it, it was just such a wonderful time. And, and uh, these two gentlemen, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Shea, revolutionized this uh, otosclerosis surgery and created immediately worldwide interest. And as a result of this interest, they were invited throughout the world. And how they ever took the time to do all this teaching all over the world is beyond me and still maintain a very active and busy practice. And Sam, I know you were the first one to get on this junket circuit with your mobilization. Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about your travels? Where, where did they take you during those years between 19, what, 56 and 58, 59? And of course, ever since then, you've been on the road, you know? I had operated R.K. Nero, who had otosclerosis, that is, was old Nero's nephew. And uh, he wore a hearing aid before, but he shed it, shed it later after the operation. And by the time I was about to do his second ear in India, he had been transferred to China. And I operated his second ear in Hong Kong. Yes, oh, really? really? That's very interesting. I couldn't go to China, and he couldn't yeah. come no. to the United States. So I operated the second ear in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember where we went after India, but it, about two weeks after we left Nehru, I had a cable from him in Honolulu. And he said, now I can hear the birds chirp. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a marvelous experience that just couldn't happen to two more wonderful But the interesting thing there. about that was, he said, when I came back to Peking and uh, was meeting with some of the leaders there, and they noticed that I wasn't wearing my hearing aid. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Sam, weren't you the first American doctor to go to China after yes. we opened up uh, with uh, the, the Nixon uh, yes. uh, opening of China, and you yeah. were, if not the first doctor, were you? I think so. Yeah. First American. Yes. That would have been in 1972. 71. 71. Well, at any rate, uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what happened to me. And then he went on to tell how I had operated on him in Hong Kong, and, and uh, then they said, well, we've got to get him over here to China. To China, <laughs> sure. And so the next thing I knew, I had an invitation from China, from the Chinese Medical Association, to come over and work there for a month. Mm -hmm. And I think you made four or five trips uh, back to China since then. Uh, yes. Yeah. But the reason um, that I, that was in 60, 66, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't get my, I couldn't get permission from the State Department to go. To go, mm -hmm. and so I couldn't go. Mm -hmm. uh, but some years later, opening my mail in the morning, there was another invitation. Uh, I know John too. I think it, uh, uh, beginning about uh, the time you introduced stapedectomy, uh, your the demand on your time was a similar thing. I can remember. Time and again, uh, hearing you were here, there, yonder, all over the world. And I, this just started all over again with you. And uh, the two of you were just traveling all the time, uh, preaching the gospel of Otis Gross's surgery. Tell us a little bit about your travel experiences. Well, about that time, as you say, about 1956, after this first uh, stapedectomy operation, 
I, I too was fortunate enough to be invited uh, to many countries to speak and to, to operate, uh, and, and in many of them, thanks to uh, a direct uh, invitation and introduction by Sam Rosen, uh, that letter went ahead of me. And He'd always so kind of paved the path for you. That's right, and grease the way. <laughs> and uh, not only uh, did I owe him a great debt of having contributed to my thinking and uh, then arranged for my education uh, in Europe, but he, uh, he then introduced me in these places that he had been and arranged for really the most interesting trip of my medical life, and that was a trip that, uh, that he made some introductions for me, and then the State Department arranged for me to make, along with some other doctors, to to a round the world trip in 1959. I, I wasn't married at the time and had, uh, had the whole summer off to, to, to make this trip. Sam wrote to some people in India uh, that he had visited with and, uh, and through these people uh, I got a very important invitation in India. I met uh, uh, Nehru himself, was introduced to him and had a very interesting meeting in his office then traveled all over India for about six weeks and then came back and met Nehru again and uh, was in India on the day of, the, uh, of their 4th of July. Uh, it's actually the 14th of August. Uh, it's the day they declared uh, the anniversary of their independence and sat right next to Nehru in the reenactment of the independence uh, celebration. This is really a high point in my career. And I had operated on General Tamaya, the Chief of Staff of the Indian Army's wife, and, and so with General Tamaya, I reviewed uh, Indian soldiers out there on the parade ground. It was just a very important highlight of my career. I would put that trip down. Yeah. Sam arranged for me to go to Egypt and operated in Egypt uh, and went down the Nile River and saw uh, Aswan and those things. It, 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 just one place after another that uh, that, that he, he uh, was very generously arranged for me to go. Uh, I think in all I've operated in about 35 countries and spoken in them and uh, been very generously made a member of those medical societies and gotten to know people. But you know, the other thing that, that I'd like to say here at this meeting between the three of us is there's one more person who should be here and that's Ned Fowler the, who was the professor at uh, Columbia medical school and a great original contributor. He's dead now and been dead a number of years. But and a tragic loss, you know. Absolutely. He was a, too young. And too he, young. He had so much to offer and so much he did offer. Right. You know? But he was a catalyst in the beginning, so generous. He, he brought us all together That's in a right. period where there was some friction going on and people were trying to decide which way to go. That wonderful, generous man called each one of us to uh, to New York to, to demonstrate the techniques that we were doing. I know, Sam, you did it first. Yes. Howard did it. I came up there and made a, a film, and I know Dick Bellucci and some Richard others. Goodhill, George Schoenbaugh. Right, right. Uh, Milo Bassett. Milo Bassett. And, uh, and, and Ned Fowler should be here. And, right. And, and we all owe him a great debt of thanks, but at least we have his movie. Yeah. I think it would be uh, lovely to show that because right. it's a very classic historical it would uh, motion picture and it really shows the problems and the things we're right. going through, and as you say, bring this all together. And it's a tribute yeah. to Ned. It's it certainly right. is. Right.